Nothing still survives from King David's reign, the wee chapel right at the top. This is the oldest building surviving in the castle today, so it's literally from King David's time onwards that the castle began evolving, eventually taking on the shape that we see today. Now, Edinburgh Castle was always a royal castle, which meant that it was paid for straight out of the pocket of the king. It did not necessarily mean that the king lived here all the time. This was just one of many royal castles and palaces that the King of Scots had all over his kingdom. When he wasn't in residence, he would leave a constable in charge. A constable would be a lord, picked by the king and charged with the care, maintenance and of course the defence of the castle in the king's name. Now, Edinburgh Castle was always built first and foremost for defence. It was a defensive residence, a fortified residence for the King of Scots. So, um, the King also had palaces, which could be as, as luxurious as the King wanted. His castles, however, were always for defence. So, uh, defensive considerations would take priority over the requirements of comfort um, of the people living within it. Edinburgh Castle had been considered a key defensive site from the early medieval period right through until the time of the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s. Now it was the last time the castle's defences and garrison was reinforced to deal with a possible invasion threat. At that time of course from the armies of Napoleon Bonaparte. Today there are three levels or wards to Edinburgh Castle. Above us is the upper ward, the most important part of the castle where all the main royal buildings are, all the main military buildings. The upper ward was often called the citadel of the castle because it had its own set of defences, had its own towers and its own curtain walls. This lower area that we're in now, it's the middle ward. The middle ward had the second line of defences. You would have found a lot of the castle's utility buildings down here as well. The homes and the workshops of the many craftspeople who would have lived here in the castle. Once through the portcullis gate, you're in the lower ward. The lower ward has many layers of defensive barriers. Several of these you can still see today, down at the bottom, is the front gate, with its drawbridge and its side edge. The gatehouse itself is actually Victorian, built in the 1880s, um, purely to make the castle look more attractive from the front. It does stand on the site, though, of the original outer barrier, the more outermost gate of the castle. Once through, you then face the inner barrier. All that's left of that are the two pillars that once held the gates themselves. In the past, though, this would have had a drawbridge and a dry ditch, just like the front gate. Once through there, you then carry on up the causeway until you reach this point. Strongest surviving defensive gateway in the castle, the portcullis gate. This was a system of four barriers. You had three sets of heavy wooden doors, just like the ones you see there today. And these were reinforced by the iron and wooden portcullis. That's the name given to the grating, which could be dropped in the face of any enemy forces. It was a very strong type of defensive barrier. Once through, you then had to make a decision. You could take the most direct route to the top via the line stairs. The original stairs were much narrower and even steeper than the ones you see today. The alternative is to take the road around to the left. This way up was added in the 1400s and allowed for easier access of cannons into the upper parts of the castle. We will head along a wee bit now and I'll tell you about some of the more modern defences that we have here in the castle.